Hello there. Are you there? Mm. Let's try that again. Searching jump pads. How's that going for you? Do you have a plan for where you'll use them? Or are you still exploring how they'll fit into your setup? Well, I've researched jump pads. I don't really want to do anything with them at the moment. Um, but I'm trying to expand some coal power, and I think I need to turn off uh, what is it, concrete production, so I can get some coal over here. That makes sense. Sometimes pausing other production lines like concrete can help free up power for more critical things like getting your coal set up running smooth. Once you get coal power established, you'll have a lot more flexibility to run everything at full capacity. Are you planning to just pause the concrete temporarily? Or are you thinking about reworking your whole power distribution? Just pausing it temporarily. That sounds like a good plan. Once the coal power is up and running, you should be able to bring everything back online without any issues. It's a great way to manage your power needs in the short term. Do you have a good spot for your coal generators, or are you still figuring that out? Uh, I think I have an all right spot. Sounds like you're on the right track. Once everything's connected and running smoothly, it'll really make a difference in keeping your base powered up. Let me know how it goes, and if you run into any hiccups, I'm here to help. Oh, that's cool. Glad to hear it. Milestone reached. Power production can now be fully automated by burning coal, which has been added to the resource scanner. 
Water is also necessary to run the coal-powered generator and will require a network of pipelines to be transported from a water source. To assist with locating and identifying water, Fixit has compiled this guide. Water is a somewhat reflective liquid and it may have thick vegetation growing nearby. To test if something is water, try touching it. If it is not solid and does not corrode your suit, it is probably water. List the books that Jack London wrote again, please. Jacqueline Wilson has written a wide range of books, mm. particularly known for her impactful children's literature. Some of her notable works include... I was asking about Jack London. Ah, oh, Jack London. He's best known for his adventure novels set in the woods, like The Call of the Wild and White Fat. These works explore themes of survival, nature, and the relationship between humans and 
animals. He also wrote The Sea Wolf and The Iron Heel, which is considered one of the earliest works of dystopian fiction. London's stories often draw on his own experiences of rugged environments, whether it was during the Klondike Gold Rush, which inspired The Call of the Wild, or his time at sea. He was a prolific writer, producing over 50 books and hundreds of short stories and essays throughout his career. If you're interested in any specific works or themes, I can go deeper into those. Give a synopsis of the dystopian one. The Iron Heel by Jack London is considered one of the earliest dystopian published in 1908. The story is set in a future where a powerful oligarchy, referred to as the Iron Heel, has taken control of the government and the economy, brutally suppressing the working class. The novel follows the life of Avis Everhard, narrates the revolutionary struggle against the oppressive regime, led by her husband, Ernest Everhard. The book portrays a world in which corporate monopolies dominate society and the wealthy elite maintain power through violence. Ernest Everhard, a charismatic socialist leader, attempts to organize the working class to rise up against the Iron Heel, but they face enormous challenges, including betrayal and the immense power of the oligarchs. What makes the Iron Heel unique is its structure. The story is presented as a historical document in the distant future with annotations from a scholar analyzing the events of the past. The novel explores themes of class struggle, the dangers of unchecked capitalism, and the idea of a dystopian society where the wealthy few control everything. It's a fascinating read, especially given that it was written long before the rise of more famous dystopian works like 1984, Brave New If you're interested in early dystopian fiction, this one is a thought-provoking dive into the future as imagined at the turn of the 20th century. Would you like more details on its themes or the historical context? Uh, how was it received? The Iron Heel had a mixed reception when it was first published in 1908. Although it sold well, reaching about 50,000 copies, critics at the time didn't widely praise it. Some found its combination of socialist ideas and dystopian fiction unconvincing as both literature and political. For example, a reviewer from The Outlook described it as having little merit as a novel and being unpersuasive as a socialist argument. However, over time, the novel gained more recognition for its prophetic insights into class struggle and the rise of oligarchy. George Orwell, author of 1984, even credited the Iron Heel for its foresight into the mechanisms of future totalitarian regimes, particularly fascism. Its brutal depiction of capitalism and the suppression of the working class struck a chord with later socialist movements. Some also view the novel as an early precursor to other dystopian books even though it remains less polished compared to the more speculative and imaginative worlds created by Orwell or Huxley. Despite initial skepticism, it has since been re-evaluated as an important, influential dystopian text, particularly for its direct engagement with socialism and its depiction of violent class conflict. That may indeed be water. Try submerging your arm. If it does not dissolve, that will narrow down the range of possibilities. Or you could just pipe it to a coal-powered generator and see what happens. Why are so many places named after Jack London? Jacqueline Wilson has received no. many honors and had...
Why are so many places named after Jack London? Many places are named after Jack London because of his profound influence on American literature and culture, as well as his adventurous spirit and commitment to social justice. Jack London became famous for his novels and stories, especially The Call of the Wild and White Fang, which captured the rugged beauty of nature and the struggle for survival. His writings often drew from his own experiences, such as his time in the Klondike Gold Rush and his adventures at sea, making him a symbol of the American frontier spirit. In addition to his literary work, London was also an outspoken advocate for socialism and workers' rights, which earned him a place in the hearts of many as a champion for the underdog. His political and social ideas, often ahead of their time, contributed to his legacy as a figure of not just literary, but also cultural and ideological significance. Places named after him, such as Jack London Square in Oakland, California, and Jack London State Historic Park, commemorate both his contributions to literature and his deep connection to nature. His works remain widely read and celebrated, cementing his place in history, making it natural for cities, parks, and other institutions to honor him. I'm afraid I'm going to have to make one of these beans an EP princess. Ah, oh, I see you're facing a bit of a dilemma. If you're needing to make a tough call like that, the princess, you can always think of it as just part of survival. Sometimes you have to do what's necessary to keep going. Hopefully, the princess will forgive you in spirit. What's your next step after that? Are you planning more exploration or continuing to expand your base? This EB princess won't go to EB. It sounds like you've got a particularly stubborn EB princess on your hands. Sometimes they can be a bit tricky to Especially if they're in a tough spot or aren't responding to them. Maybe try circling around, getting a higher vantage point. Sometimes approaching from a different angle. Hang in there. You've handled them before, so you'll get this one eventually. Mm, I'm not sure you're right about that. I think I need some uh, other tools to get this one to sleep. Or eat. It sounds like this particular EP princess might require a different approach, especially if the usual methods aren't quite working. If you're thinking you need some other tools or upgrades, perhaps you could look into researching or crafting more advanced equipment, like rebar guns, explosives, or even better defensive options. These kinds of tools can often make a big difference when facing tougher challenges. Have you unlocked anything new lately that might help with putting this one to sleep more effectively? Or is it time to focus on upgrading your arsenal? Yeah, I think I need a better arsenal of EP weapons. That sounds like a solid plan. Upgrading your arsenal is definitely the way to go when dealing with tougher EP processes. Weapons like the rebar gun, explosive devices, or even upgraded melee tools can make a big difference. If you haven't unlocked them yet, focusing on tech upgrades in the MAM, molecular analysis machine, could give you access to more powerful weapons and defensive tools. It might also help to research alternate combat strategies, like using jump pads or higher ground to your advantage, making it easier to handle more stubborn EP princesses from a safer distance. Keep pushing forward, and soon you'll have all the tools you need to handle anything that comes your way. Fixit pipelines can contain any fluid, including the water necessary for coal-powered generators. Note, water does not flow upwards by itself. While water extractors provide some lift to truly defy gravity, consider the use of pipeline pumps.
Is there a Jack London Park in Sonoma? Yes, there is indeed a Jack London State Historic Park located in Glen Allen, Sonoma County, California. This park was the home and ranch of Jack London, and it preserves over 1,400 acres of land that London called. Visitors can explore historic buildings like Wolf House, ruins of his intended home, and the House of Happy Walls Museum, built by London's wife, Charmian, after his death. The park also features scenic trails, picnic areas, and plenty of nature to enjoy, all while learning about London's life and works. It's a beautiful spot, and a fitting tribute to Jack London's adventurous spirit and literary legacy. Is it something you might be interested in visiting? Yeah, maybe. It would definitely be an interesting place to check out, especially if you're into history or... With its mix of literary history, scenic landscapes, and preserved artifacts from Jack London's life, it offers you experience. Plus, the hiking trails and ruins give you a bit of adventure, much like London himself. If you ever decide to go, it seems like there's plenty to explore. Whether it's London's ranch, the winery ruins, or simply taking in the Sonoma County. Tell me a cool historical fact about Sonoma County. Here's a cool historical fact about Sonoma County. It's home to the site of California's first commercial winery, Buena Vista Winery, which was established in 1857. Founded by Agostón Harasti, a Hungarian-American often called the father of California wine, Buena Vista helped lay the foundation for the region's thriving wine industry. Arasti was a pioneering figure who introduced many European grape varieties to the state, and his influence helped transform Sonoma County into one of the most famous wine-producing regions. It's amazing how this legacy has endured. Today, Sonoma County remains a major hub for wine tourism and Mm, tell me some more facts about uh, something like ooh, physics or computer science. Sure. Here's a cool physics fact. Superconductivity. At very low temperatures, certain materials can exhibit superconductivity, meaning they have zero electrical resistance. This allows electrical current to flow indefinitely without losing energy. Superconductors also repel magnetic fields, which leads to levitation. You've probably seen demonstrations where magnets float above superconductors. That's because of this phenomenon. Scientists are still researching ways to create room temperature superconductors, which could revolutionize how we store and transmit energy. And a computer science fact. Moore's law. This is the observation made by Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles approximately every two years, while the cost of computers is halved. While the pace of advancement has slowed in recent years, this principle drove much of the rapid progress in computer technology over the last few decades. It's why computers have become exponentially more powerful and affordable. If either of these areas piques your interest, I can dive deeper into Is Moore's Law dead? The idea of Moore's Law being dead has been a subject of debate for some time. Moore's Law, which predicted the doubling of transistors on a chip every two years, 
driving exponential growth in computing power has indeed slowed down. This is largely because we've hit physical limitations with silicon-based chips, such as issues with dissipation, the size of transistors approaching atomic scale. However, while traditional silicon-based scaling might be slowing, Moore's law isn't Innovations in new materials, chip architecture, and even quantum computing are being explored to continue pushing performance forward. For example, companies are working on new technologies like 3D stacking of chips and neuromorphic computing, which might allow for continued progress, even if it doesn't follow the exact exponential growth model of Moore's law. In essence, while the pace predicted by Moore's law has slowed, Technological progress in computing is far from over. It's just evolving beyond traditional scaling methods. Is it possible for microprocessors, uh, well, I don't know quite how to phrase this question, but we're already reaching the limits of uh, what's physically possible based on quantum tunneling. So are they as small as they can get now? Or is the transistor as small as it can get now? Or could it ever be smaller? You're on the right track with your question about reaching physical limits with transistor size. As transistors get smaller, we're indeed approaching a point where quantum tunneling becomes a significant issue. Quantum tunneling occurs when particles like electrons pass through barriers that classically they shouldn't be able to. And this causes leakage currents in transistors, making it difficult to control their behavior on extremely small scales. Currently, the smallest transistors in commercial use are around 3 nanometers, but further shrinking becomes problematic due to quantum effects. However, research is ongoing to explore materials and architectures that could allow us to continue pushing boundaries. One new materials. Scientists are looking at alternatives to silicon, like graphene and carbon nanotubes, which might allow transistors to be smaller and faster without the same quantum tunneling issues. Two, quantum computing. Instead of relying on classical transistors, quantum bits, qubits, could be the foundation of future computers. These don't operate in the binary fashion that traditional transistors do, but use quantum states to represent information in new ways. Three, spin electronics and molecular transistors. These are emerging fields where information is stored using the spin of electrons rather than just their charge, or even using single molecules to function as transistors which might allow for even smaller components. So while we're reaching the limits of how small traditional silicon transistors can get, future advancements in material science and paradigms may still allow us to create even smaller and more efficient processing components. Cool. Glad you found it interesting. The future of computing and the potential for even smaller transistors is definitely a fascinating area of research. If you ever want to dive deeper into quantum computing, materials science, or anything else tech-related, feel free to ask. How is it that iPhones are able to communicate with satellites? iPhones, starting with the iPhone 14 series, are able to communicate with satellites thanks to a feature known as Emergency SOS via satellite. This feature is designed for emergency situations in areas where there's no cellular or Wi-Fi coverage. Here's how it works. 1. Satellite communication. iPhones use low Earth orbit LEO satellites to send emergency messages. These satellites orbit the Earth at a lower altitude than traditional satellites which allows for faster communication with mobile devices. In Apple's case, the iPhone connects to satellites operated by Global Star, a company specializing in LEO satellites. Two specialized antennas, 
The iPhone contains hardware capable of connecting to these satellites. Since satellite communication requires a direct line of sight, the phone uses a combination of its GPS and compass to help users orient the phone towards the nearest satellite, making it easier to establish a connection. Three, compression and short messages. Due to bandwidth limitations, only short text-based messages can be sent via satellite. Apple has implemented a message compression system to minimize the amount of data sent, making communication more efficient in emergencies. Four, emergency relay centers. When you send an emergency SOS message via satellite, the message gets relayed to an emergency response center that can notify local emergency services on your behalf. This capability is mainly for life-threatening emergencies in areas with no traditional service, such as remote wilderness regions. And it's part of Apple's broader efforts to enhance safety features in its devices. Tell me about how it communicates with the satellites. When iPhones communicate with satellites, it involves a few key technical steps. One, direct line of sight communication. Since satellites are orbiting above the Earth in space, the iPhone needs to have a clear line of sight to the satellite to establish a connection. This means the user typically needs to be outdoors with minimal obstructions like tall buildings or dense forests. The iPhone uses GPS to guide the user to orient their phone to the satellite to ensure a proper signal. Two, low Earth orbit, LEO satellites. The satellites used for iPhone communication, like those from Global Star, are in low Earth orbit, LEO, typically orbiting at altitudes of about 300 to 1,200 miles, around 500 to 2,000 kilometers above the Earth. LEO satellites move quickly, so the iPhone's system works to find and maintain a connection when the satellite passes overhead. Three, special antennas and radio frequencies. To enable satellite communication, iPhones are equipped with specialized antennas that can send and receive signals on the appropriate satellite frequency band. Unlike cellular signals, which are often blocked by obstacles like buildings or mountains, satellite signals can travel over long distances in space and connect directly to the phone. Four, data compression. Since bandwidth is very limited when communicating with satellites, Compared to cellular networks, the messages sent from the iPhone are heavily compressed. This allows the system to transmit essential data, such as a user's location, the brief emergency message, without requiring a lot of bandwidth. Five, two-way communication. Once connected, the iPhone allows for limited two-way communication. In the case of the emergency SOS feature, for example, users can send a brief predefined message describing their emergency. And emergency responders can send back simple instructions or questions to better assist the user. Overall, iPhone satellite communication combines satellite tracking, signal compression, and specialized antennas to make emergency contact possible, even in remote locations without cellular coverage. The satellite itself acts as the relay, passing messages between the iPhone and ground stations, which then forward the information to emergency services. Milestone reached. The Xeno Basher is a direct upgrade from the Xeno Zephyr. In the words of the engineer that first developed this tool, quote, the Zephyr kind of electrocutes things, the Basher straight up smacks stuff while also electrocuting them, unquote. It is beneficial during encounters with aggressive fauna and has been tested thoroughly. The engineer's noble sacrifice for Xeno research will not be forgotten, whoever they were.
Uh, tell me an interesting fact about Tico Brahe. An interesting fact about Tycho Brahe is that he lost part of his nose in the duel. In 1566, while studying at the University of Rostock, Tycho got into an argument with another student, a fellow nobleman, over a mathematical... The argument escalated into a duel, during which Tycho's nose was seriously injured. As a result, he wore a prosthetic nose for most of his life. According to reports, this prosthetic was made from a mixture of brass and silver. Despite this colorful incident, Tycho Brahe is most famous for his incredibly accurate astronomical observations. Without the aid of a telescope, which hadn't been invented yet, he meticulously charted the stars and planets, leading to major advancements in understanding planetary motion. His work paved the way for Johannes Kepler to develop his laws of planetary motion, revolutionizing astronomy. Tell me more about Kepler. Johannes Kepler was a key figure in the scientific revolution, most famous for his three laws of planetary motion, which describe how planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits. These laws were revolutionary because they challenged the long-held belief, dating back to Aristotle and Ptolemy, that celestial bodies move in perfect circles. Here's a bit more about his life and work. One, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. First law, law of ellipses. Kepler discovered that planets orbit the sun in an elliptical shape, with the sun at one of the two foci. Second law, equal areas law. This law states that a line connecting a planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times, meaning that planets move faster when they are closer to the sun. Third law, harmonic law. Kepler found a relationship between the time a planet takes to orbit the sun and its distance from the sun, essentially showing that the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Two, Kepler's early life. He was originally studying to become a theologian, but became interested in mathematics and astronomy. His work with Tycho Brahe, who had compiled the most precise astronomical data of the time, provided him the observational foundation to develop his thoughts. Three, Kepler's role in optics. Kepler also made significant contributions to optics, explaining how vision works and how light behaves. He described how the human eye formed images, using lenses to focus light. His book Astronomia Pars Optica, the optical part of astronomy, is considered foundational in the study of optics. Four, Kepler's work on gravity. While he didn't fully develop the concept of gravity, as Newton later did, Kepler speculated that some force emanating from the sun influenced the motions of the planets. This idea laid the groundwork for Newton's universal gravitation. Kepler's laws not only reshaped our understanding of the cosmos, but also influenced later scientists like Isaac Newton, who built upon Kepler's work to develop his theory of gravity. Kepler's blend of meticulous observation and groundbreaking mathematical insight truly set him apart as one of the great figures in scientific history. Would you like to explore one of his laws in more depth? Uh, yeah, sure, pick one. Let's dive into Kepler's second law, the law of equal areas. This law states that, that a planet moves faster when it's closer to the sun and slower when it's farther away. But it does so in a way that the line connecting the planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Here's a simple breakdown. Imagine a planet orbiting the sun in an elliptical path. When the planet is at a point closer to the sun, called perihelion, it moves much faster. Conversely, when the planet is farther from the sun, helion, it slows down. However, if you draw a line from the planet to the sun, the area this line sweeps over in a given period of time will always be the same, whether the planet is near the sun or far away. This law was crucial in rejecting the idea of uniform circular motion, where planets were believed to move at a constant speed. Instead, 
Kepler showed that the speed varies depending on the planet's distance from the sun. The deeper insight here is that gravitational forces from the sun influenced the speed of the orbiting planets, which was a concept that helped pave the way for Newton's later work. The mathematical precision of this law also allows us to predict planetary positions more accurately. It changed the way people understood the dynamics of our solar system and was key moving beyond the old geocentric models that assumed planets orbited Earth in perfect circles. Does this law connect with any particular interest you have, or would you like to explore how it plays out in other celestial How does it play out in other celestial mechanics? Kepler's second law, the law of equal areas, plays out not only in planetary motion, but also in various other systems governed by gravitational forces, including moons, comets, even artificial satellites. Here's how it applies more broadly. One, planetary motion. As mentioned, this law is directly observable in the orbits of all planets in the solar system. Each planet follows an elliptical orbit, and as they get closer to the sun, their speed increases, ensuring that equal areas are swept out in equal intervals of time. This applies to any object under the influence of a central gravitational body, like Earth around the Sun or around their respective planets. Two, comet orbits. The same principle applies to comets, which have highly elliptical orbits. For example, Halley's Comet speeds up significantly when it approaches the Sun, and slows down as it moves away. Despite the dramatic changes to its speed, Kepler's second law ensures that it sweeps out equal areas during its orbit, whether near the Sun or in the distant reaches of the solar system. Three, moons and satellites. The law also governs the orbits of moons around planets. For instance, Jupiter's moons like Io and Europa move faster when they are closer to the planet and slower when farther away, again adhering to Kepler's second. Similarly, Artificial satellites placed in elliptical orbits around Earth experience changes in speed that align with this law. Four, binary stars. In star systems where two stars orbit around a common center of mass, binary stars, the same principle. Each star moves faster when it's closer to the center of mass and slower when it's farther away. Yet they both sweep out equal areas in equal time. This helps astronomers predict their movements and understand the dynamics of binary systems. Five, orbital mechanics for spacecraft, Kepler's second law also plays a key role in space missions. When spacecraft travel in elliptical orbits, their velocity changes as they move toward or away from Earth or other celestial bodies. Mission planners use this principle to time maneuvers like gravity assists, where a spacecraft's speed is increased or decreased by passing close to a planet. By understanding how the craft's velocity changes according to its position in orbit, Scientists can precisely calculate energy-efficient paths through space. In short, Kepler's second law is a fundamental rule that applies across various contexts involving elliptical orbits, whether you're dealing with planets, moons, comets, or artificial satellites. It helps astronomers and scientists predict movements in systems where gravity governs orbital behavior, and it remains a cornerstone of celestial mechanics today. Do you have any particular application of this law that you'd like to explore further? Uh, what types of laws do astronauts need to know to be able to calculate things when their instruments fail them? When astronauts find themselves in a situation where their instruments fail, they must rely on basic laws of physics and orbital mechanics to navigate and make calculations. Some of the critical laws they would need to know include 1. Newton's laws of motion. First law, inertia. An object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by a force. This is crucial in the vacuum of space where there's no friction and any movement continues indefinitely unless countered. Second law, F equals A. This is essential for calculating how much force is needed to change a spacecraft's velocity and acceleration given its mass. Third law, action and reaction. Used when astronauts need to understand how actions like firing a thruster or pushing off from an object will affect their motion. Two, 
Kepler's laws of planetary motion. First law, elliptical orbits. Astronauts need to understand that spacecraft travel in elliptical orbits with the celestial body they are orbiting at one focus. Second law, equal area. This helps calculate velocity changes at different points in the orbit. When closer to the celestial body, the spacecraft moves faster. Third law, harmonic law. This helps predict the orbital period of a spacecraft based on its distance from the celestial body. Three, law of conservation of momentum. This is particularly useful if an astronaut has to navigate without external propulsion, for example, pushing off an object. The momentum of the system must remain constant, so understanding how a small push will change velocity is critical. Four, law of universal gravitation. This allows astronauts to calculate the gravitational is acting on their spacecraft based on their distance from a planet or other celestial body. Knowing this can help determine how fast they need to travel to maintain orbit to escape gravitational like the escape velocity. Five, orbital mechanics, Hohmann transfer orbits. Understanding transfer orbits like the Hohmann transfer orbit helps in determining the most fuel efficient way to move. This could be vital. They need to adjust their path using minimum sources. Six, the Selkovsky rocket equation. This equation allows astronauts to calculate the amount of fuel needed to achieve a certain velocity change, delta. If instruments fail, knowing the relationship between mass, fuel and velocity is critical for managing limited resources. Astronauts train extensively on these principles and often use backup methods like manual calculations based on these to ensure they can safely navigate each these fundamental principles form the backbone of space travel, and astronauts' ability to fall back on them in critical situations is essential for survival in space. I think I might call it there for the day. Sounds good. Take care, and feel free to drop by whenever you're ready to chat again. Have a great rest of your day.